Bye bye. We're glad you're with us. We're at East Coast Church here in Ringwood, New Jersey, and Skyline Lakes Fire Department. We're here every Sunday at 10 o'clock. If you're in the area, love to see you. We're continuing our, our message on the end times. We started last week talking about the rapture of the church. We're going to finish that off today. And then next week, we'll have a basic Thanksgiving message. And then after that, we're going to look at the Ezekiel War, the Ezekiel 38, chapter 38, the war it talks about. After that, we'll get several sessions into the tribulation. And then later, the millennial reign of Christ. But today, we want to finish this up on the rapture of the church. Today, we want to talk about the Bible feast. These feasts, the feast calendar points us to the timing of the rapture. And uh, Jesus has fulfilled most of these feasts. A couple of them that haven't been fulfilled yet. The feasts are dress rehearsal of what's ahead. Now, there's seven of them the Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets. Some days of all before the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, when we look at the feast, sometimes it can cause us to be confused if we don't understand what the Bible says about them. The Bible is very specific about each one, and it's very easy to understand. Let's look at Passover first. It was started by God to commemorate the deliverance of the Israelites from the bondage of Egypt, the Egyptian bondage, and saving of the firstborn from the destroyer. You see that in Exodus 12, 13. Exodus 23 and Exodus 34, those chapters. It was to be a land without blemish, a sacrifice, the blood was applied to the doorpost, as well as um, to the side as well. And the death angel passed over that home because of the blood. It was a symbol of Jesus, the Lamb of God at Calvary, who took away the sin of the world and sacrificed for us. So that's the first one is Passover. The second feast is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This one's very interesting. The Israelites would take three pieces of bread. They folded the middle piece, they pierced it and broke it. Mm -hmm. What does that sound like? Mm -hmm. The middle piece. Mm -hmm. So here we have these three pieces of unleavened bread. One piece, you could say, represents one of the people on the left of hanging Jesus, the other one on the right, and the middle one, they actually pierced that one and broke it, symbolic of the Messiah. You know, symbolic of Jesus, the bread of life, being born in Bethlehem. It's interesting. I didn't, I didn't re realize this. I just researched the word Bethlehem means the home of the bread. Home of the bread. Remember Jesus said, the bread of life. That's what Bethlehem means, the home of the bread. The Feast of First Fruits celebrates the first fruits of harvest. The crucifixion of Jesus was quick. Usually crucifixion is very long. In his case, they shortened that up. Uh, they didn't realize what they were doing. You want to know why they had it, why they had to be shortened? Jesus had a feast to go keep. There's a feast he had to go keep, and so that was actually shortened by God. He took our sin, our poverty, our sickness upon himself at the cross. He died quickly. And he died on Passover. He was buried on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He rose again on the Feast of the First Fruits. Now, this freaks out Jewish people. And the reason it does. Because those three must happen for the Messiah. And since Jesus fulfilled those, it proves to the Jewish people, to all of us, that Jesus is the Messiah. Amen. The fact he did all three of those in those in that order and those events. That's important to know that. And that's why we bring that up today. It does prove that he is the Messiah. The Feast of Pentecost, we've seen that fulfilled over in Acts 2. They, they were... Uh, you know, they were looking ahead to that day someday, but they actually have the Feast of Pentecost. The fifth Feast of Trumpets has not yet been fulfilled. This one's very interesting. The Rosh Hashanah, or Feast of Gatherings, it means in Hebrew, the head of the year. Everybody say head. Yeah. The biblical name, Yom Terah, or the day of shouting or blasting. It appears from the Bible, this will be when the rapture of the church happens. The Bible's not totally clear on it. We can't hang our head exact on it, but it looks like it. I mean, if I had heard for Sunday, I'd say at least, I would say it, to me, 9% of, of chance that he's coming uh, for the church during the Feast of Trumpets. It, that's what it appears to me from looking at the Bible. Could be wrong, but I, if I had to pick one, this would be one I'd pick. Does this mean we'll know when the rapture will be? Well, to some degree, because... We know when the Feast of Trumpets starts in Israel and when it's finished every year. We know that. 
Like, and so I believe in that every year when the Feast of Trumpets comes in, from this point until Jesus returns, we should not high alert as Christians. It's a time for us to not be on high alert, but we do not know the, the specific year. Though in 2023, the Feast of Trumpets started on Friday evening, September the 15th, ended Sunday, September 17th at sundown. And so this year, that's when those days happen. So I said, that's why I think from this point on, we need to be on high alert about that. Now I'm going to show you something in connection to that because the church has been misled and mistaught about the return of Jesus. And as Hunt has had some wrong teaching about not knowing at all when he's coming back. And that's not entirely true. We'll show that here in a minute. Fifth, the Feast of Trumpets. It represents the, the beginning of a coronation of a king. The coronation of a king is a private ceremony for the family, a public ceremony for everyone else. When we are raptured and taken off the earth, we will attend this private ceremony in heaven where Jesus will be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We see that. Now watch this. The Feast of Trumpets always falls 29.5 days after the last new moon. After the last new moon. Do you remember in the Bible about the Sanhedrin? That group of religious people? Yes? The Sanhedrin would send out two witnesses, and they still do this day, to determine when the new moon was, and then they announce when it is. That's why Jesus said, no one knows the day or the hour. Now notice that. He didn't talk about the month or the year. He said no one would know the day or the hour. Interesting. And you talk about the Feast of Trumpets. The reference is Matthew 24, 36. Jesus might have been possibly trying to give the church a clue that we would be raptured during the Feast of Trumpets. That's a possibility. We can't prove it entirely, but it's a strong possibility. In the second coming, he will be presented to the whole earth in a public ceremony as the King of Kings and as the Lord of Lords. Everybody will see that. The sixth feast is the seven days of all before the Day of Atonement. This gives us a picture, really, of the seven days, I mean, excuse me, the seven years of tribulation. The church is raptured first. We're not here when the tribulation starts. We're gone. Seven days in the world is when the world's kind of in awe. These seven days after we're gone, it's like, oh. I mean, this is the biggest event the world's ever seen, is us being taken off the earth. So they're going to be shocked and in awe, kind of shocked and awe. But it's also perfectly correlated to the seven years of tribulation. And then the last feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. Jewish history recognized as God's salvation, shelter, provision, and faithfulness. The second coming could happen during this timing of the Feast of Tabernacles when Jesus returns in his bodily tabernacles of men. The rapture is signless in the Bible. The, the rapture, there's not many signs we see of the rapture in the Bible. The second coming has sign after sign after sign after sign. All of these things are coming to pass now, but we're still alive here on the earth. The Bible shows the six raptures itself in the Bible. Enoch, Elijah, Jesus, the church, and the two witnesses later. And we put the reference points up there for you. I don't need to read those so you can have those and those are on the mobile app if you like. Let's look at some of the scriptures here concerning this. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. And some people get confused because and this passage of scripture is talking about two separate things, not one thing. And, uh, and that's why this is important to us to be able to look at this. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that means his second coming. That's why I put that in parentheses. And by our gathering together unto him. That's the rapture in the same sentence. People have confused those things. They're not the same. They're, these are two separate events. That you that you be not shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by your spirit, neither by the word, nor by the letter, as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except that we have fallen away first, that man is sin will be re uh, revealed in the son of perdition. That means the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the church is taken off the earth. We won't be here when the Antichrist is being revealed. We'll be gone already. 
the moment the church departs, Satan then starts influencing and he starts taking power and has full access to things here in the earth. The church is God's restraining force while we're still here. We really hold the devil in check until we leave. Remember we said in the prior teachings that Jesus has given us authority over the works of the devil? We're destroying his works like Jesus did? Well, that's why we're that restraining force. That's why we have to be out of here before the Antichrist is revealed. If we were here, we would take authority over him. And that can't happen in the end times. So we are God's restraining force while we're still here. We have so much authority in the earth that God literally has to remove us. Or we, well, we, we would be dictating what would happen in the end times and during the tribulation. God has 3.5 years. He gives the devil the last part, which is the 3.5 years of the tribulation. Think about it. Jesus had 3.5 years of his ministry here on the earth. These numbers are not by chance. Nothing in the Bible is by chance. The devil has been given the last 3.5 years of tribulation by God, and uh, the Antichrist will have the 3.5 years before that. The Antichrist functions for three and a half years on his own, being influenced by the, by the devil. So when Antichrist is revealed to the earth, he'll have 3.5 years. The devil will influence him. But then, Lucifer possesses him for the last 3.5 years. Are you hearing me? So when the Antichrist, after we leave, he'll be revealed. Once he's revealed to the earth, he's got 3.5 years. At the end of that 3.5 years, the devil enters into him and possesses him for the last 3.5 years. Everybody got that? But remember, we're gone when that happens. Before that happens, we're already off the earth. Okay, we're gone. Thank God. Now, the tribulation period is put in the earth by God. Yes, there's the wrath of God being poured out. And yes, there's some judgment. We'll see in the scriptures here in a moment. But the biggest reason for the tribulation is to get the Jews to accept Jesus as the Messiah. It's God's show of force to convince them once and for all that he is the Messiah. And it's going to take some doing to do that. You know, a good correlation to it. You remember Moses and Pharaoh? And every time there was something God did to demonstrate the power of Moses, Pharaoh has some excuse for it. That's the way we get the tribulation. People go, oh, you know, when the plagues are hitting, when the vials are open. Oh, and they'll still harden their hearts somehow. Which is really sad to see. Really sad. We'll look at it later, down weeks from now. But during the tribulation, people actually get saved because the Holy Spirit is still here. Mm -hmm. But you want to go the first bunch. Mm -hmm. Don't hang out with the second bunch. All right? Mm -hmm. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. For this lawless, lawlessness is already at work secretly and will remain secret until the one who's holding it back steps out of the way. Who's holding it back? The church is. Oh. That's why we have to be taken out of here. Think about this. Law, lawlessness is already at work. Can we say that's happening today? Is it lawless out here? Mm -hmm. Some degree it is. He said, he'll remain secret until the one who's holding back steps out of the way. That's the church. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed. Notice after we're gone. But the Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him with, under his coming. Another example of the church being taken out of here before the tribulation begins. Now, we are expected to be at the reward seat of Christ. So when we're taken off the earth, we have two major events coming, the reward seat of Christ and then the marriage supper of the Lamb that we will attend in heaven. I said this before, I'm going to say it again. The tribulation is to motivate the Jews to accept Jesus as the Messiah. It appears when Jesus comes back for the church, there will be great anticipation, a growing excitement about his return. Bible talks about, look up, your, your redemption is drawn here. We will know he's about to come just before he comes. Okay? We'll be, have this expectancy. To give you an example of now, since I started this series on the end times weeks ago, I have seen just driving where I drive other churches that are now teaching on the end times, on their signs. I'm amazed by that. In other words, pastors are hearing the same thing. Start preaching on my return. Start preaching on the end times. Traveling ministers, I know, are starting to speak on it more. Missionaries are speaking on it more. That shows me the body of Christ. God's talking to the leadership of the body of Christ about his return, which means it's getting closer. Are you hearing me? 
And so we have to understand the time or the times that we're living in. Now, I think it's a time to reflect. We will be going over in our mind, our spirit, everything we know about his return, and we'll start expecting to see him. When we're in that season of his return. The rapture is the beginning, it's not the end. Amen. It's the beginning, it's not the end. See, some people say the rapture is the end of the church. No, this is the beginning of a whole new way of life for us. Going from this life that we know here to glorified bodies, a new heaven and a new earth, a millennial reign. I mean, all sorts of new stuff's going to happen. And that should bring us excitement in our spirits. We will see Jesus face to face. Think about that. You're going to see your Lord and Savior face to face. We will worship like we never had before when we go into heaven. So here's some reminders. We will leave the earth while God deals with the Jews for seven years. God has promised us that goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. Is that true? That's Psalm 23, 6. That means as long as we're out here on the earth, we have mercy and goodness following us. So wherever I go, I got God's goodness and his mercy following me. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. First John 4, 4. That's uh, so what I have five foundational scriptures that I base my whole entire spiritual life on. This is one of them. I have probably worn this scripture out more than anything else. Take the thought of the devil, reminding him that the greater one lives inside of me, that I'm greater than he is, and putting him on the run. Amen. Our angels have charge over, over us. Psalm 91. Boldness is the atmosphere for the manifestation of Jesus. I want to say that again. Boldness is the atmosphere. For the manifestation of Jesus himself. You want to see Jesus come on the scene for you? No matter what you're doing in life, you want God to come on the scene, suddenly show up and his presence show up? Get bold and talk to people about him. And as soon as you, that boldness kicks in, you start sharing about Jesus, here comes his presence every single time. We're going to see more of that in the days ahead. We should always be bolder than the devil. We're the children of God. And the end time preaching should be bold and full of faith. So I think we're going to see more and more preachers get bolder and, and even get greater faith in their life in the days ahead because of the time we live in. And we should be bold. Mm -hmm. It's not time to be ashamed of the gospel. It's time to preach it and share it with people. Because we don't want anybody going through the tribulation. We don't want anybody going to hell. We don't want anybody missing heaven. We want everyone, everybody going with us. Everybody. The worst person on the face of the earth, we want that person to go to heaven. Amen. I'd like to see the whole army of Hamas and Hezbollah Amen. go to heaven. I'd like to see every antichrist that thinks they're the antichrist go to heaven. I'll see every person that thinks they're go to heaven. Not all will, but we want them all to. Now, we're going to shift gears here for a minute. That's talking about the rapture. And I'm going to show you some things in connection with this. How many of you ever heard of the 70th week of Daniel? Daniel's in the 70th week. We're going to look at numbers here, here for a few moments. This will astonish you how the Bible lays this out. So easy to understand. So we know right where we're at in these end times. Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 through 3 in the New Living Translation. Listen to this. It's the first year of the reign of Darius, the Mede, the son of Azarus, who became king of the Babylonians. During the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learn from reading the word of the Lord. Now, look, if Daniel's reading the word of God, you think we should? Yeah. His reading that word kept him, what, well, kept him behind his mouth shut later. That's what the word will do for you. And he deals to Jeremiah the prophet that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. How many years? 70. 70. Remember 70. So I turned to the Lord and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting, I also wore rough burlap and sprinkled myself with ashes. So God was shown Daniel why Israel, quote, was in jail, so to speak. Israel got into an act of disobedience year after year after year, and God started getting upset with him. He showed him, showed Daniel, all the nations leading up to the rapture. Showed where they'd be in location as proximity around Israel. Israel was, was supposed to let the land rest for seven years. Remember that? You're reading? The seventh year, they were supposed to rest. No planning, no work in the fields. And guess what Israel did? They, did. they rebelled and didn't do that. And they still planted during the seventh year. 
They kept doing that and fudging on it year after year. What's 70 times 7? 490 years they did that. 490 years of rebellion against God, and they did not let their land rest for 490 years. Which means, listen to this, they owe back 70 years. Because he told them how many? 70 years to start with, right? And so God said, okay, you're disobedient, i got to go with disobedience, so I'm going to make you pay me back those 70 years. Are you with me? Remember when Peter asked Jesus how many times you should ask 70 times seven. to be forgiven? 70 times, times seven is what? 400. 490 years. Those are not by chance. Those numbers are not by chance. Now let's go on. And, 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 and in 9, verse 23 to 25. At the beginning of the supplications, the commandment came forth that I have come to show you, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. Verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon my people and upon my holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for inequity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now therefore, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem and to the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. Three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. So this is the word Gabriel brought. He's a messenger angel to Daniel. Seventy segments of seven equal 490, like we said. God said Israel blew it for 70, probably for 490 years. He gave him another chance for another 490 years. When you look at verses 24 and 25 we just read, we see going forth, to rebuild the temple until Jesus comes back is a certain number of years. If you timeline it, it's 483 years. If you put a timeline on going forth to rebuild the temple until Jesus comes back is a certain number of years, that number of years is 483 from the Bible. Jesus rode into Ruth, into, no, listen to this. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that donkey exactly 483 years later. Isn't that remarkable? He owes them seven years of Old Covenant time. This is what's referred to Daniel's 70th week, is these seven years of Old Covenant time that they are owed. The church must leave so God can give back to Israel those seven years. Are you with me? That's why we tear take it out, and that's why it's a seven-year period, because once he gives them Israel back that seven years, the four nights has been fulfilled. Are you with me? So the seven years of tribulation are to get the attention of the Jews from God. Israel has 12 tribes to this day. There will be 12,000 evangelists taken from each one of those tribes, and there's your 144,000 Jewish evangelists who evangelize the nation of Israel. To get them saved. But we're gone when that happens. Jude 14, 16. Now Enoch, the son from Adam, prophesied about these men and saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Those are people who have died before us. To execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust. They mouth great swelling words, they're flattering people to gain advantage. In other words, we're seeing here that just before Jesus comes back, the climate in the earth is going to get irrit irrit irritability. <laughs> you got stuck on it. People are going to be irate, irritable, irritable of one another just before Jesus comes back. Daniel 9, 26. After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not from himself. The people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of war desolations are determined. This talks about who was going to kill Jesus, who will handle the platform of the Antichrist. It talks about who will destroy the city like the Romans did in AD 70. Daniel, verse 27. Daniel 9, 27. Then he... 
talking about the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, midway through the seven years, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes the desolate, even until the consummation which is determined poured out on the desolate. And that's a lot. It sounds confusing. But you break it all down. The Antichrist is influenced by the devil for three and a half years. He's then possessed by the devil for three and a half years. Lucifer has 42 months to operate through a man. Just like Jesus had 42 months on his ministry in the earth. Equal time. Amen. Amazing. The Bible does not say or specify the timing of when the Antichrist is revealed. He, we do not get the timing of when he'll be revealed. I mean, it could be days, it could be weeks, it could be months. We don't know the exact time when he'll be revealed, but he will be revealed. So the Bible says the tribulation begins when the Antichrist signs an agreement. Now, when he signs his agreement, he is possessed by the devil with Israel, and that agreement will be for seven years. No scripture defines the time of the event. We don't know exactly how much time takes place, but there will be an agreement. So this means we do not know exactly when the tribulation begins. It could be several weeks, months, or years after Jesus comes back for the church. Once we're gone, it could be days, weeks, months, or even years before the tribulation starts. We don't know. It's interesting when you start putting things in correlation to the Bible, it's 42 months. Elijah prayed it would not rain for how long? 42 months. Second Kings 2, 23 and 24, we see two female bearers come out of the woods, and, they, and those two female bearers mauled 42 of them to death. 42 evidently is a number of judgment. Amazing, isn't it? You think about it. Female bearers, not male bearers, mm -hmm. female bearers. So who is Jesus? He's the bride or the groom? Groom. Groom. Who are we? The bride. Female. Again, just showing a prophetic word for the future of the church. Interesting. Do you remember when we had uh, the, the Iraqi war? Remember Colin Powell being on TV a lot? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the shots showing Colin Powell you know, about the Iraqi war behind him was a map. And in that map, you saw the great river of Euphrates, a couple other rivers as well behind him. Not by accident. After that war was over with, the, back of the, war, the, the Iraqi war, there now are four nations that have bases in Baghdad. The United States is one, England does, Russia does, and France does, as well as Germany. Actually, I think I said four or five. Russia, England, France, Germany, United States now all have a base in Baghdad. That's important for the end times when the nations surround Israel. And already in Iraq, you have these four nations with five nations with bases. Now I want to say something to you. According to the Bible, Israel was never given any land away. They disobeyed God again. Mm -hmm. And they did. Originally, there was not a group of people, there was not a Palestinian nation or state years ago. Didn't exist. There was no such thing. When Israel gave the land to them, mm -hmm. it all started. Mm -hmm. Had he not given the land, we wouldn't be having what we have today there. Right. God knew all that. The European Union gives the Palestinian government, quote, the formal one, that's foreign, $400 million a year. The United States gives them between 800 million, 800 million to a billion dollars a year. Israel gave Gaza to the Philistine people yes. to disobey and they and God and did that. Immediately, those people started firing rockets into Israel, even before the recent one. This has been going on for years, the rockets coming over, but not as many as what we saw, you know, a few weeks back when they started, you know, throwing thousands of them at one time. Remember the story of David and Goliath? And that's why David declares he'll defeat him because he has no covenant. That's something that's not taught much. How do you know that? The word Palestine, everybody say Palestine, Palestine. comes from the word Philistine. Interesting, right? In Hebrew, it means no covenant. In Hebrew, it means no covenant. So the devil finds out 
His time is short when he enters the Antichrist. And so, then, listen, today the devil doesn't know his time's running short. That's been mistaught from the word in churches. He has no clue what time it is right now, the devil. He has no clue his time is running short. He doesn't realize that until he possesses the Antichrist. Okay. Revelation 12, 12. He has no clue until then. He doesn't know the time or the season we're living in even today. The devil midway through the tribulation is thrown out of heaven into the earth. He goes into the temple to present himself to God. He finds out he has three and a half years left. He cannot tell time. God has to tell him, you got three and a half years and then you're done. Isn't that amazing? You think about it. I mean, he goes in to the temple of God and God himself looks at him and says, you got 3.5 years left. Now he realizes his time is short. So having seen all this, what are some final thoughts on the rapture? It will be the greatest event the church has ever seen. Mm -hmm. Nothing will top this, ever, before or after. It's amazing what God is doing during this time. For us, the Christian, there is no tribulation. We don't go through it. We're out of here. There's more verses about the tribulation, those seven years, than anything else in Scripture. There's not one, one subject that has more information about it than the tribulation. That's how important it is to God. In a few weeks down the line, we'll look at all every part of that seven years in detail. So why are so many people afraid of it? You ask people, you talk to Christian people, I'm talking about Christian people. We know Jesus is their Lord and Savior, yet they're afraid of the tribulation. Why are they afraid? They've been taught wrong. They've been taught wrong. If you've been taught that, that, that Jesus isn't coming until halfway through the tribulation, that put fear in you. Who's the author of fear? Satan. Satan is not God. Amen. So Satan is twisting everything to get put, put other people in fear. Why is he working so hard to put God's people in fear? Because then we're not bold. Whenever you fear something, you back away, you back off, and you're not bold. And you don't take authority, and you give your authority to him, and he uses that against you. Are you hearing me? We know Jesus comes before the tribulation. There is no mid-tribulation rapture of the church. There's no post-tribulation. He comes before it ever starts. If you run to somebody who a Christian believes the other way, ask him this question. Why would God? Why well, I'd back it up this way first. I'd say to him, does God love the church? Well, yeah, he gave his life for it. He loves the church more than anything else. Does Jesus love the church? Oh, yeah, he, he died from grace. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then why would he pour out his wrath on his church? You can't answer it. It makes no sense because it comes completely against Scripture. So people are teaching post-trip, mid-trip are wrong. And there's a lot of people who have been taught wrong things about the Bible. And they want to argue it. Don't argue it. Just show them what the Word says. The Word's plain on it. We're out of here. He would never pour out his church on it, his wrath on his, on his kids. we got two people today here that have come with their newborn babies here at the church. As husband, wife, father, mothers, would you pour out your wrath on that child? There's no way in the world would you. Would you protect that child for your entire life if you had to give it? Amen. Sure you would. Well, I would too. So see, that makes no sense. God would never pour out his wrath on his children. Are you hearing me? Mm -hmm. Yet people believe that because they've been taught wrong. And people are afraid to read the book of Revelation that they think they can't understand it. You can understand it. It's written to show us what's going to happen in the tribulation after we're gone. Why would you spend so much time showing us about the tribulation more than any other subject in the Bible? Why has God shown that much time and given time to the Bible for that? There's only one reason. To motivate us to get people saved before that ever happens. To motivate the church to get people right with God before it happens. To take as many people with us when he comes back to the church so these people don't have to go through the tribulation. That's why he spent so much time describing those awful seven years, because he wants us to be motivated to reach people with the gospel. Collectively, as a church, as East Coast Church, 
individually for each one of us that are here, as well as the whole body of Christ here in the earth. God tells us we'll be blessed by reading the book of Revelation. So God said to you, if you read the book of Revelation, you'll be blessed. Yep. Are you going to be blessed? Yes. Yes, you will be. Then why did anybody read it? Don't you want the blessing? Afraid. That's it right there. Because of fear. Afraid to read it. Afraid to identify with it. And then the devil gets twisted so he can't understand it anyway, so he, why even attempt to read it? He doesn't want us to know what the book of Revelation says. He doesn't want us motivated to reach the lost. He doesn't want us motivated to reach people who don't know Jesus like we do. If he can keep us from reading it, we won't, it takes away the blessing and we won't be motivated. And we'll go into this idling thing. Why do you think Jesus raising up ministries now that uh, like Sean and Father are going throughout the nation, having these worship services out in the middle of nowhere, out in the cities and places, and thousands of young people, or young, thousands of people are coming to praise and worship God. Uh, that's going to become more and more of the normal before Jesus returns. There's going to be the start of difference. Finally, Christians are getting some backbone. We're going to line up and be willing to go willing to the public and display what we know about Jesus to people before he returns. The greatest healing we won't necessarily be seen inside church, but it will be seen outside in the streets. We like have the people out there watching being healed. See? We've got to get past our doubts and unbelief and start believing God in faith that what the Word says is true and act like it's true and be doers of the Word. And if we'll do that, then we'll see the results of it. Are you hearing me? Amen. And so the church has to wake up. Because according to what we've just seen in Scripture the last two weeks, we will know the season of his return. The exact specific time, no, but we will know it's drawing close just before he comes back. And when that trumpet blows and there's a shout from heaven, we will hear, the whole earth will hear that. And I don't care what any actor or actress says, any well-known person says, if they don't, if their words don't line up with the word of God, it won't matter. I don't care if your name begins with an O, an L, a T, it doesn't matter. It will not. But you think it's going to happen, won't happen. We know the Bible says, and we're going to stay with the Bible, not people that don't know. Are you hearing me? God tells us what will happen before it happens. He means he wants us informed. The, now think about this for a minute. The end time we're teaching on is all about your future and my future. When we read about the end times and the rapture of the church, and that's going to be the Ezekiel 38 war, and then the tribulation, and then the millennium of Christ. He wants us informed. He wants us to know ahead of time. He wants us to know. So we're going to know. How many of you have ever experienced in your life when you sense there was a change coming and you're going to go to a new season? You sense change was coming to you. Almost everybody's raising their head, and almost everybody is nodding their head or, you know, saying yes. The same way you knew that, you'll know he's about to return. How do you know that? A witness in your spirit. God put a witness in your spirit. He will alert each one of us just before Jesus comes. I love what the Bible says. We will look up and know our redemption is drawing near. That's, I mean, no one's going to know the exact moment, but we will know just prior to him coming. We'll say something's different. We'll start looking up. And then we'll see him with all those angels. All those people come before him, coming back on those horses. What it's like that's going to be. So remember, the end times are about our future, not our past. Not our past. We have a great future as a body of Christ. Let me ask you this question. This is an interesting one. It brings to a close of that. How many of you still have some things in your heart that God has shared with you that he wants you to do that you've never done yet, yet you haven't done yet? Things in your heart he's shown you to do that you have not yet done. See your hands. Now I'm going to share something with you that maybe you never thought of before. He will continually put things inside you on top of what you already have there. But so you have inside your heart that you still haven't done you'll not do in this lifetime. Some of that you'll do in the millennial reign of Christ. 
not now. And it's already been put in you now. And when you are raptured out of here and receive a glorified body, those things will still be in there. And when you come back to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years, you will be put in charge of possibly cities, states, nations, process according to your abilities that God gave you and what you did with those while you're on the earth. But you will feel something in your heart during the millennial reign of Christ, not during this lifetime. How many of you can say that's a new thought? You'll never fulfill everything in your heart. See, a lot of people think, well, everything will happen. I'll get it all done before he comes back. You won't. There will still, when he comes back against the church and gravity loses its grip on you, and you will go in the air to meet him in the air, and you, as you're going, you get this glorified body, you will not fulfill everything on the earth. We as a church will not have fulfilled everything on the earth that we were to do. There'll still be more to do, and when we come back to rule and reign, we'll start doing some of those things. And we'll have a thousand years of Christ on the earth, a new heaven, a new earth, and then the new Jerusalem come down to the earth, and then we'll have eternity to do some of these things. Can you see how badly we've been mistaught sometimes about the end times? It used to bug me. How can I get everything done that's in my heart to do? Before it comes back, and I realize I'm not going to get it done. He's put it in there, not only for now, but for the millennial reign of Christ as well, for later. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to the millennial reign of Christ. I'll have a glorified body. Now, you know what I want to do with that glorified body when we first first him back to rule and reign? I think we're going to have some recreational time during those thousand years and during the eternity. I don't know about you, Debbie, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get myself translated from here to Scotland. Play the old course. <laughs> play 18 holes in the morning, then I'm, then I'm going to translate it to Pebble Beach, play 18 that yeah. afternoon. You get translated to Pinehurst 2 later, Bay Hill later. I'm going to take a golf. I don't have to take an airplane or have to drive a car. I'll just show up like an angel shows up. How about you? You got something you'd like to do you haven't done? Yes. Hmm? Think about it. No planes, no trains, no cars, <laughs> gas or electric. Translated. At the speed of an angel, wherever you want to go. Think about it. I mean, I won't, I, I, I'm just dampening your, your taste buds because we've got a couple weeks away from this. Think about an earth with no oceans, no water, no seas. There'll be no islands. It's going to be a whole different earth. This is pretty good. But the glorified one doesn't eat that. We need water on the earth. Fine. We've got to have the oxygen produces. We have to have water produced. There's things we need, and that's why there's so much water on the earth. We need that water to survive. Without it, we wouldn't survive. But in a glorified plant, there's some things we don't need. We'll show you these things later. It's kind of about your appetite. But I'm looking forward to that day. You can't come quick enough for me. I don't know about you. But again, I want to take every person we can with us. So let's make an effort today. Let's start making a, a greater effort to understand the times we live in. He has come back for the church. We will be raptured out of here before the great tribulation happens, and we will go and meet him in the air. We'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Amen? Amen. Those of you watching today by video, God bless you. We're glad you're with us. Never get this. He's come again. He came the first time. He's come the second time. Make sure you give your heart to him, your life to him. If you haven't done that, do this right now. Pray with me. We want to pray here together. And we want to pray with you. Pray this with me. Say this with me. Lord Jesus, I do believe in you. That you lived. That you died. You were raised from the dead. So my sins could be forgiven. Jesus, forgive me. Every sin. Every failure. Come in my heart. And be my Lord. And be my Savior. Fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being with us. Jesus is Lord. See you next week. God bless you.